send a shout out to all my families and friends in Denver and New Mexico and Texas. We're all together in this. So we'd like to perform these next two songs and dedicate these pieces to my family and friends, the, the Gonzaleses in Colorado. <laughs> song, I want to dedicate this next song to all the farm workers, todos los campesinos que trabajan todos los días, who are out there working, even in this crazy threat of, of this virus. We need to support our farm workers and those who, who really feed us every day. So it's dedicated to all the campesinos out there. Mm -hmm. Mexico you come to the Sacramento Valley to toil in the sun your wife and seven children they're working everyone and what will you be given to your brown eyed children of the sun Your face 
face is lined and wrinkled And your age is 41 Your back is bent from picking Like your dying time has come Your children's eyes are smiling Their lives have just begun And what will you Sunday to the Capitol you come you fought for union wages though your fight had just begun you're a proud man you're a free man and this heritage is one that you can be given to your brown night chief Thank you. We want to remind everybody to make sure you take care of each other because we're all in this together and it's very important that we take care of our own people. Thank you very much. Hello, good evening. Good evening, everyone. Welcome. Uh, we started off this Platica series on a different note. We wanted to serenade you with some lovely tunes by the amazing Daniel Valdez and his grandson, uh, Daniel Valdez. That was a pre-recording of a message uh, that was delivered, uh, music that was delivered uh, at the Chicano Music Festival. So we wanted to just set the tone, uh, serenade you all with those beautiful tunes. And I just wanted to welcome everyone uh, this evening. Uh, my name is Octavio Barajas, and I will be moderating uh, this event. And I am also a professor of ethnic studies at the College of Sequoias. And so uh, you may have, uh, for those of you who've been part of these platicas, uh, you've seen me in, in prior moder moderating prior platicas. And I just wanna just welcome everyone and thank everyone for being here. I see we already have uh, over 30 uh, participants who are live with us this evening. So welcome and thank you for joining us. This is a speaker series of the seen and unseen. And today's Platica focuses specifically on ethnic studies, a case for equity. And so we really wanted to bring this Platica forward to actually address uh, this field of study, this interdisciplinary field of study. And so we have an awesome panel uh, this evening, and uh, we will have uh, reflections by the youth who've been able to participate um, in this project, the Favela Art uh, Expressions of Chicana Chicano Art Project, either by going to the gallery in person, seeing the virtual tours, attending previous platicas, and we're just I'm just honored myself to be able to, to facilitate this platica where many of them will be able to share with you this evening their perspective, uh, their experiences with ethnic studies, either at COS or in high school. So uh, we prepared this evening for that purpose to be able to get in. And so we want to begin uh, with, uh, with a brief uh, uh, comment and mentioned about some of the upcoming events that we have uh, with, our, um, with our Favela project. And so what we have going on, uh, we have several things that are still gonna be taking place for the rest of this month. For those of you who have not gone to see the Ricardo Favela exhibit, you can see it 
uh, virtually or make an in-person visit. And we will have um, that information dropped in the chat. And so you can actually click on it and make sure that you actually have it on your browser so that you can actually research it and look into it more after we uh, finish with this evening's event. It opened up on the 3rd of March and it will take place until the 26th. So there's still time if you haven't gone. And if you've gone once, go twice, go three times. And we actually will have also virtual chats about the exhibit and they take place on Sundays. Uh, the next one will be the 14th at 2 p.m. And there'll be information circulating on that as well. Uh, on the 21st, we're gonna have a very special virtual chat with special guests of the Royal Chicano Air Force. So we're gonna have members of the Royal Chicano Air Force there, and we will have actually hosting that one, we will have uh, Eddie Salas, Fast Eddie Salas will be hosting that virtual chat for the 21st. And also on the 21st from four to six, we'll have mobile art project, and it will be a brainstorm. A reimagining justice is that theme of this mobile art project. So those of you who are interested, you know, make sure you chat. We have members of our committee who are present and who are ready to ch uh, chat with you and give you more information for those of you who are interested in that. And our very last platica, our very last platica for this project is scheduled for the 25th of March. And it's seen and unseen the art and legacy of Ricardo Favela with some very special guests. We will have uh, Josie Talamantes with us once more and Ricardo Montoya, hijo de Jose Montoya, and this will be hosted by Eddie Salas. So you don't want to miss it. So stay in the loop. We'll have more links dropped in the chat uh, that will direct you to the Arts Visalia webpage, and we'll also direct you to the Facebook page for the Seen and Unseen Project. You know, make sure that you friend that page and, you know, encourage and, and spread the news. And also at any point in this platica, you are welcome, you know, drop in your comments in the chat, uh, drop in. We're going to see some other videos. We're going to see some more things throughout this, this platica. And so, but further, we will also want to make sure that you get a chance to meet the panelists. We have uh, an amazing, an amazing uh, group of panelists today. So at this point, I really want to just give you a chance to hear from them directly. And so we will begin with Alejandra. Alejandra, would you please uh, introduce yourself? And while you introduce yourself, we will also have panelists uh, tell you a little bit about what they thought about that song, that beautiful song, uh, Brown Eyed Children of the Sun and Primavera, and kind of their impressions about that. So without further ado, let's hear from the panelists. Yes, thank you, Octavio. So I'm Alejandra, I'm a first year English major, and I've done independent research on Mexican American history, specifically the Bracera program. And when I first heard Brown Eyed Children, I like really thought of them and just of the continuity of farm workers and their experience in the United States. Like he mentions that like their backs are bent from picking and that like they traveled like such long distance. And then like he sort of ties in like, oh, what are you gonna tell your children, you know? And like, I just couldn't help but think of them of how like they've like done so much and yet they're so little recognized or they're recognized so little. Um, and it was just fascinating to me. It's just like not much has changed and especially not much has been taught. Yeah, so I can go next. Thank you, Alejandra. Um, my name is Jacqueline Canchola Martinez. I'm my current senior at Redwood High School. Um, and I've also taken uh, Ethnic Studies 10, which is Social Justice Studies at CUS. Um, so the song to me was also very powerful uh, for a lot of different reasons, but I think mostly because it brings up a lot of images of the Central Valley and also of my like own family, um, like as a daughter of a farm worker, it definitely brings that experience to the forefront of, um, of your mind and of what those, of what farm workers and people that have to work um, difficult jobs in the Central Valley, what they have to go through every day. So it just creates those really um, tough images, but also almost like brings you home in a way. So, yeah. Hi everyone. Um, my name is Christina Kniff. Um, I am a first year student at COS. Um, I am enrolled in ethnic studies at COS, um, Black American studies this semester. Um, I am also the president of the COS Young Democrats Club. Um, I will plug in information in the chat for any COS students that um, might be uh, wanting to join the Young Democrats Club. Um, mm -hmm. 
I'm honored to be here. I want to thank a uh, professor for giving me the opportunity to be a part of this platica for allowing me the opportunity to um, speak and let my voice be heard. Um, I was a little nervous at first, uh, but I, the more I thought about joining this, I felt sort of a duty to uh, let my voice be heard. So I'm in great company uh, with my fellow panelists. Um, I'm inspired by them. They've all done uh, great work in school um, and throughout the community. Um, when it comes to the songs, um, well, the first thing that I noticed was uh, the multi-generational bond right there with uh, Mr. Valdez and his grandson. Um, and it just reminds me of the relationship um, that we have with our elders and the fact that they are like um, our ties to our history. Um, I mean, when you look at their faces, you can kind of um, see everything that they've been through. Um, my grandfather, I, I still am blessed enough to have him living. Um, he's 95 years old, but when I look at him, I just see, I see struggle, I see success. Um, I see resiliency. And so, um, yes, I echo what my panelists said, my fellow panelists said. Um, I get visual images of farm workers, of them doing um, backbending labor. Um, I also come from a family of farm workers, um, and I know the struggles that they um, faced. And so, uh, one uh, little thing that I heard too in the song uh, is when he says love for all humanity. So I don't know if anybody else got a chance to hear that part, but um, I, hear, I heard that and I feel like uh, it, it symbolizes why we're all here, right? For the love of humanity, um, for the fight for ethnic studies, um, to bring ethnic studies to our young people um, and this fight for inclusivity. So uh, yes, I'm happy to be here. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is David Martinez. Um, born and raised in Visalia. I'm a senior at Red High School. Uh, one of the co-founders of the club, me and my good friend, Ephraim Gonzalez, started our school called the Multicultural Appreciation Club. Um, as far as our thoughts, or my thoughts on the song, um, the Prima Veda, I thought it was a really peaceful, had a real nice strong vocals and I think for me it painted a picture of just peace and happiness and it's just a an image of setting that we should ultimately strive for and then for the song Brian out Brian out Brian Brown eyed children um I was able to make numerous connections um, with the lives of my grandparents because both were uh, farm workers and they had to sacrifice so much you know for their families and I admire the drive and how much they put um, into their labor and just seeing um, how successful they've turned out to be over the years, it's really inspiring. Hi everyone, my name is Marlene Hernandez. I am a first year current student at College of Sequoias. I'm enrolled in sociology and I'm super excited to be here. Um, this is my first time in the Platica, being enrolled in the Platica and I wanna thank my professor, Dr. Maria for introducing me to these Platicas, very beautiful and very inspiring to me and I believe to others as well. And uh, my first time hearing the song, I thought it was very beautiful. Um, it brought up a lot of good points for the farmers and it was very inspiring to me. And also the vocals that both, both of them had was very beautiful and touching and really made me feel comfortable hearing it and brought up a lot of memories in my head of my family, my grandparents, of them playing guitars outside or singing outside, like enjoying the music because they would always say music is part of an art. It's very inspiring. It's a beautiful part of art and I really enjoyed hearing it. It's very inspiring to me and I feel like to others also. Hi everyone, I'm Neftali Gonzalez. I'm a senior at Redwood High School and I'm a current student in the Ethnic Studies course at Redwood. And um, as my friend Xavier mentioned, also co-founder of the Multicultural Appreciation Club at Redwood. Um, my thoughts upon hearing both of those songs, I was very connected with my roots. Um, I know music has really been a big part of my life and my family, as well as culture really. And it's always really beautiful to hear um, what 
art people can put together and also the message that comes with those songs. And definitely for me as well, um, the message of the farm workers and how hard that is because my family is from farm workers and my grandparents I know had many years of hard labor. And to me, that really spoke to me as well because I understand that struggle. And I understand that I'm a prophet of that struggle. And that's definitely resonated with me. Hello, everyone. My name is Amba Rodriguez. I am a social studies teacher at Farmersville High School. I have the privilege to teach ethnic studies. So looking at equity and using ethnic studies as a curriculum is biggest focus ever. And I'm super excited to be part of this panel. As far as resonating with the music, I think it's very reflective, not just of the community of Visalia, but also where I teach at in Farmersville, our Central Valley. These farm workers exist. And not only is it laborious work at a time in a global pandemic, they are considered extremely essential or else we don't eat. So reflecting on the type of access they have to healthcare and to other resources is also reflective, not just they're out doing work in the field is what type of resources are needed for these types of communities, our communities, and how doing ethnic studies can help us realize or come to the conclusion of this pride and this awesomeness that exists in our valley. So really excited to have the privilege to teach ethnic studies and this platica, so yay. Good evening, my name is Venicia Moreno. I am currently a COS student in the Chicano studies. And um, I just like to say how grateful I am to be a part of this panel. Um, the songs it just bring great homage to why I am studying what I am and to continue expanding my education for my, um, for like my daughter, for just younger generations, because my grandparents who were um, farm laborers instilled that in me to see how important education and to know who you are is super important. And I just want, would like for that to continue in younger generations for the time to come. Awesome, thank you so much panelists. Uh, uh, what a wonderful engagement uh, with a song that was produced like decades ago uh, by Daniel Valdez and featured on his album Mestizo. And to, just to be able to see these connections uh, that you all are making on how it really underscores of importance of narratives here in the Central Valley, the connections, the personal connections that remain uh, with many of us with uh, farm workers directly, indirectly uh, here in the Central Valley and the resonance that it's had with each one of you uh, just brilliantly articulated. And uh, I think uh, our participants this evening will agree. So drop some comments there in the chat, um, you know, show some love here for our panelists and we are barely getting this evening started. And so this is just the introduction and we will now uh, make a transition. But before that, I just wanna leave off with that question uh, that Daniel Aldez actually uh, is inserting into his lyrics. Uh, what will you be giving uh, the brown eyed children of the sun? Uh, just what a just just a beautiful song overall. And thanks again for sharing your thoughts, uh, panelists. So next, what we're gonna do is uh, we're we're beginning here with this platica. We're having some conversations about the song that's coming from the movimiento, with Daniel Valdez being you know, a very important contributor to the UFW, singing these songs that were part of the movimiento uh, that helped, and, and brother of Daniel Valdez of Teatro Campesinos. And some of you may even recognize Daniel Valdez came out in La Bamba and other movies uh, and so many other productions. So it's uh, great to actually start off with some, with, some, with some canto, some music. So next, what I would like to do is we're gonna make a, a, a shift and we're gonna begin with the poem. Um, and just to provide you a little bit of a context of this poem, uh, this is a poem that I actually, I have some connections to, uh, to the poet, Jose Bayo. Uh, Jose Bayo uh, is a student at Bakersfield College where I uh, was employed. I was working there in the history department before being brought on board here at COS in, in ethnic studies. And so, uh, so I had a, a personal connection here with Jose Bayo as a mentor 
and continue to this day in communication with him. In fact, I was in communication with his mom uh, today. And so, um, so this, uh, this friendship really, uh, really unfolded because of the kind of the work that I uh, was doing in Bakersfield with the Dreamer community. And so um, what actually occurred um, in the summer of 2019, uh, many of us went before the County Board of Supervisors at the Truth Forum. And the Truth Forum are held intentionally in counties throughout the state where there, there's a need for transparency and the need to actually for law enforcement to talk about their relationship or how do they actually interact with ICE. Because we're a sanctuary, sanctuary state, um, there is not supposed to be any kind of relationship with law enforcement with ICE. So these truth forums are held for the purposes of transparency where the sheriffs will actually vocalize, you know, how do they handle cases when they actually come across someone who's undocumented. So during the summer of 2019, Jose Bayo went before the county supervisors and he actually shared a poem, shared a poem called Dear America. And so in this poem, as you will see uh, in here in the in next, uh, he actually, it brings forth the voice of the undocumented community. And, um, and within 48 hours after he actually delivered this poem, he was actually detained by ICE. Within 48 hours, he was detained by ICE and he was in detainment. And so he was detained. And so, uh, and so he continued in detainment through the whole summer and was very high anxieties and concerns of what would actually happen to Jose. Um, there was a, an order um, that he was gonna go before a judge in August and this judge had a reputation for being very strict very hard in, in, in ordering deportations. And so, and this was coincided with my very first day working as an ethnic studies professor at COS. And so I was ecstatic. I was happy to have the opportunity to actually meet so many students on my first day and to interact and, and to teach. But I also had in the back of my mind, a concern of what was gonna be the fate of Jose Bayo if he would not actually meet Bell his bail was tens of thousands of dollars, which no one had, and which also called for maybe collateral for to convincing someone to be willing to put their home down as collateral in order for him to get out of bail and to not have to go before this judge at the San Francisco Federal Court. So as soon as day one uh, in 2019, as it ended, I'm driving back uh, to Kern County from Visalia and I get a phone call and it's Jose Bayo's mom who actually calls and she is uh, telling me, uh, well, she calls it, it's her, her name on the ID and it's Jose's voice. And he's telling me that he's actually been out. He's been out of detainment. And I'm thinking, how did this happen? How did this happen? And that's the second part of the story I will tell you after you actually hear uh, this poem. So without further ado, this is Jose Bayo Summer 2019, the Truth Forum. My name is Jose Bayo, and I'm speaking just individually. <clears throat> I have a lot to say, but two minutes is I'm not gonna get to it. I would just like to say more, but I like my poem to speak for me. <clears throat> the poem is called Dear America. Dear America, our administration has failed. They passed laws against our people took away our rights and our freedom and still expect to be held? Charles, dear America, you and your administration cause fear, fear through separation. Instead of building trust with our people, do y'all prefer this racial attention? Oppressed, I live my life in frustration. Private prisons, political funding, mass incarceration, you make the connection. I speak for the victims that pay for the scam. Vietnamese, Jamaican, African, Cambodian, Mexican, Salvadorian, on and on. Together we stand. We demand our respect. We want our dignity back. Our roots run deep in this country. Now that's a true fact. Dear Americans, you might be asking yourself, what's the whole point of repeating these facts? Well, I'm here to let you know, we want to feel safe whether we're brown, Asian, or black. We don't want your jobs. We don't want your money. We're here to work hard, pay taxes, and study. The fight has begun. We will never be apart, Chiquito, is what I promised my son. 
Y'all can try to justify your actions, try to make excuses. The bottom line here is that at the end, the people always triumph and the government loses. Dear America, do not consider this a threat. Our intentions are to continue making America great. It's time to begin standing up for what's right. Criminalizing children, separating families, our national security, does this make it all right? No, it doesn't and it won't. The youth have to stand up. We have to unite with our peers. Let's begin educating our children, speak wisdom into their ears. Because at the end of the day, I am you and you are me. Together we are. Sincerely, those seeds you try to bury. So again, everyone, those are the that's uh, Jose Bayo's poem on Dear America. So you just get a sense of how powerful that message is and transmit it. Um, and so I was, as I indicated to you, um, he actually called me um, after my first day uh, of work at COS, and I'm on my way home, and he's telling me he actually made bail. And the big question is, how did this happen? Uh, how did this happen? How did he make bail? Um, well, it turned out uh, two NFL players from the Players Coalition. My name is Jose Bayo, and I'm speaking just individually. Actually, <clears throat> bailed them out. I have a lot to say. Here we have uh, Demario Davis, who's a linebacker with the New Orleans Saints, and Josh Norman, who's a cornerback in the Washington football team, who actually heard about his story, Players Coalition in New York, and who decided that it was important to get Jose Bayo bailed out, a detainment. And so they put up uh, the, the finances through the Players Co Coalition and to bail out someone here in the Central Valley, Jose Bayo, um, which was very significant. And Jose Bayo, afterwards, he continued organizing and he continues to this day. And this is an event that took place that fall. Um, and this is very significant. Here you have both NFL players, Josh Norman and Demario Davis, who thought it was significant. This is during NF NFL schedule playing time. They came over to Central Valley to support Jose Bayo's event that was also called Dear America. And they came out in support and it was just very important. This is kind of, you know, the work that continues to be done by Jose Bayo on his behalf and the kind of narratives uh, that are often not really making the headlines about um, this is also an image here um, by the Bakersfield Californian that captures a narrative of black and brown solidarity of two NFL players who are standing up to the occasion to support the undocumented. And so it's very seldom do we actually hear those narratives and, and, and much less uh, hear about them circulating here in the Central Valley. And so the second part here of our, of our program this evening is to really have this opportunity to hear the voices uh, you know, interact, uh, the youth, the students at AMBAR as a, as, as a teacher of ethnic studies to interact uh, with the contents of this poem, to have this interaction. And so, for, so at this point, I want to turn this over uh, for conversation amongst our panelists uh, to be able to offer their thoughts, to be able to respond, to be able to comment on, on, on the poetry, on the story, on the story that actually is centering the voices of the undocumented. So we have our panelists um, now, which I will turn uh, the platica over uh, to Christina. Uh, so Christina uh, will begin uh, the platica and engaging uh, this poem of Dear America on this question. Yes, thank you. So, um... First thing was when you were setting this up, Professor, and you were talking about this truth forum and um, the, you talked about this need for transparency. Um, that stuck out to me because I feel like it's connected to uh, this fight for ethnic studies, right? This need for transparency, this need for truth um, in, in academics. Um, this need for truth to be told to our students. Um, so, so right off the bat, that that stuck out to me. Um, and as I was hearing Jose say this poem, um, he talks about how he has a lot to say, but he's he can only fit it in this two minutes, right? Well, I think he 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 managed to fit quite a lot 
in that uh, in that poem, right? Um, very powerful words. And um, some of the things that stuck out to me that he said was um, how America has taken rights away from, um, you know, his people, from people of Mexico, um, for, uh, deported them, um, but yet they still expect to be hailed. America still expects to be hailed. So, you know, when I heard that, I, I thought about um, that's true, you know, that uh, uh, America expects to be, you know, seen as this great country, um, but yet they're doing these things behind the scenes that aren't living up to this great reputation, right? Um, these doing these inhumane things, deporting people um, who really are just seeking a better life. Um, and, you know, another thing that he said was, I live my life in frustration. And I feel like that it can be said for a lot of people of color. Um, and, you know, particularly those who aren't necessarily being, being taught their history, right? The truth of their history. So, um, you know, when he talks about living his life in frustration, uh, I understand that because, you know, it, it just we it can be connected back to this fight for ethnic studies and the fact that you know we we want truth in our education and um, you know another thing that he said was it's time for the youth to stand up and so as I'm sitting here in this platica with you know my fellow panelists who are many of them high school students um, you know I I feel like right now is the time for youth to stand up. And right now in this moment, we are seeing youth stand up. We're hearing their voices and we're hearing what's important to them. Um, and he also said, let's start educating our children, right? For those of us that have children, um, you know, I think about my son who's two years old. I think about his education um, and what that will be like. And so um, here I am, you know, trying to, um, fight for, um, for him, you know, and, and I'm trying to pave a path for him, you know, so that he will be better equipped to, uh, to, to live in this world. So, um, the other thing too, one more thing, um, before I hand it off was, uh, that you mentioned the black and brown solidarity. And that was something too, that I noticed, I mean, just visually looking at this picture, right. Um, and I thought about the TWLF, the third world liberation front, right. Um, those were um, some of the first uh, groups of people that um, were, were fighting for ethnic studies. And um, one of the things that, that I noticed when I was learning about them was the solidarity, the, the multicultural solidarity. So um, I also think that that's important to note. And um, I think that it's possible, lots of things are possible when people come together. Yeah, I think, um... This poem was very, for me, pretty emotional here for the first time, um, but yet very meaningful and important. Um, I think uh, the points that he makes, Jose makes, um, adds a lot of the flaws that exist in our country today. And I know that his story isn't the only, only one that exists today, um, but it represents, almost, well, it represents like his struggle with, with oppression. I really like the point that he made saying that our roots ran deep in the country, uh, dates back he almost like gives you like a little brief history lesson as to like, you know, how, you know, California was originally part of Mexico, you know, we claim this land first. And I think that's, it's shed just a very, you know, impactful yet very emotional for me. And I think it's a story that everyone does need to hear. You know? It needs to be spread to not only just our youth and our uh, background, but to everyone across, across the country. Yeah, I want to agree with that because, um, and I think Octavia mentioned this, how like this poem is really for, like it makes, it tells the narrative of someone who didn't make headlines or like something along the lines like that. And I think that's so true because like, um, like the way that history is taught in K through 12 um, education is that, you know, it starts with 1492 with Columbus and like th there's even a rhyme. Um, and then like, it just goes through history. Like you have a civil war, you have a civil rights movement and then the Equality Act. And there's a few like more contemporary events but the way that it's taught implies that race relations have somehow steadily improved over the years. But that's not really true. You get stories of like 
people who are detained by ICE and like police brutality and all these different things. And it's like, well, like why, like, you know, why isn't this like discussed? Like um, a lot of people may say like, oh, it's not appropriate for classrooms, but what leads you to believe that it's not appropriate per se? Um, like it all impacts the lives of people of color. And um, that's one of the reasons why we're fighting for ethnic studies because there tends to be erasure and the current history curriculum is really westernized. You don't really hear a lot about what people of color face. And, you know, um, I think Christina mentioned this too about how it's, um, it's, uh, there, it's time to educate the children or like something along those lines too. It's like, oh, well, like now's really our chance to fight for this. And like, we're so close, like we already have like at least one ethnic studies class at Redwood and like over the years, it might be a requirement. So like we're making steps toward fighting for that equity and that solidarity within the education. I think Alejandra and Christina and most panelists said it beautifully that this is why ethnic studies is needed in our curriculum. And it's not necessarily to speak the truth because we obviously know it's the truth and our current curriculum is very Western centric. So when we think of the idea, dear America, are we thinking about a geographic space of a continent? Are we thinking of America as an empire? And where can we have those types of conversations in an ethnic studies class? And to reduce it to calling it alternative history or an alternative narrative is extremely insulting by people. So we can reclaim the term and it's just regular history curriculum. Unfortunately, we are existing in a space where people keep referring to it as alternative. So having panelists, having youth stand up saying, we want this truth. This should be part of the regular historical narrative, but instead we're having it called this alternative history. So super proud of the panelists and everyone who's been speaking up and saying, this is our truth. This needs to be spoken. What is Dear America? And we can have those conversations in our ethnic studies classrooms. It's open to any panelists who wants to jump in. Um, actually going off of what pretty much everyone um, has, all of our panelists have said so far, and especially um, Ambar, I couldn't agree more um, with the idea of the importance of ethnic studies for that reason, as you were saying. And also, I think something that the poem even touched on um, was this idea that uh, he says that he lives in a sense, constant sense of like frustration. And I think that that's a common thing for, you know, anyone who identifies with eth ethnic studies or anyone who has faced that type of oppression in the United States. And I just feel like um, one of the common criticisms of ethnic studies is that it creates some sense of victimhood for, uh, for people of color. But in reality, I think like, uh, I think Jose is his name, I believe, the poet, he catches it, he captures it perfectly in this idea of frustration. Because when you're always constantly living in this sense of frustration, you believe, you come to believe that that is your reality. That is how it's always been, that's how it's going to be. Um, but I think that just proves the importance of ethnic studies. We need to be empowered. We need that. We need to learn our history in order to be empowered and to understand that um, we come from strong people and strong stories and we deserve to continue to live that way, not in this sense of frustration, so. Oh, snaps. Let's have uh, another panelist. Another panelist, please uh, contribute to the platica. I think Give that me. was Sorry, well said, Jackie, as well as going off what Alejandra said, um, we don't really learn very much about our own history and really the history of others. However, that is the history of Americans because um, everyone in American society contributes to American culture and this country and what makes this country essentially the United States of America. And the only way we'll really be able to appreciate, you know, the struggles of other people, the struggles of our people is to learn what they have gone through. And something I often hear as a student, as I am taking this uh, ethnic studies course is that, oh, this happened, you know, a long time ago, like it doesn't occur anymore, things are getting better. However, just as we heard, this is very recent um, in 2019. Um, that was like, not that long ago, even for me, I was still in high school. And so I feel like with that being said, there's this kind of like shadow in this curtain of, oh, this isn't going on anymore. Things are getting better and they're not getting better. Um, 
And the only way they will get better in the first place is if we're learning about the reality of it. And um, I think Alejandra also mentioned like, it's not appropriate. However, uh, we are young adults um, in the high school setting. I know a lot of other students do become offended when someone brings it up. Oh, you're not old enough to be having these conversations. However, um, this is the time in which we need to have these conversations as we continue on to higher education um, and as we graduate high school, because if we don't have these conversations now, um, we never will have that opportunity. Thanks, Neftali. And I hate to uh, do this, but we're going to uh, just wrap this part up. Your panelists are on fire. Like, wow, fabulous job on these dissecting, engaging, and analyzing. Uh, just brilliant minds uh, right here shining this evening. And just want to just uh, acknowledge that we have other uh, parts in this. So we are getting these wheels. They're spinning. They're, do they're going well. So to each one of you on the comments that you're engaging on this part, I think it's also just one thing I want to state before we make our transition is the fact just what you're touching on, Neftali, is this is something not from the deep past, but this is happening right now. And in my case, teaching these classes of ethnic studies, it never fails. Every semester I get, I have open projects to do a research paper and it never fails. I'll have a student who tells me that their family has been broken up at COS, a, a student at COS that tells me in their papers that their father has been deported, that their deal has been deported, that this is happening to other students, you know, and right now at COS. And so, and, and this poem is Chiquito, I promise, you know, I will never be apart from my son, you know, that's, you know, and so, so that is also, you know, how this, this is part of the voices, the experiences of the undocumented right now. And so these are things that are happening. And right now, also, we have hundreds of kids from Central America that are on the U.S. border in Mexico right now. How is Biden going to deal with this? And it's not an issue of the Republicans and, and the Democrats. You know, each administration, there is a, there's, you know, there's, there's a deportation machine. That's the name of a book by Adam Goodman. Talks about it doesn't matter who's in office. The undocumented are always treated in this way. And so families are broken historically. And even in the present, this continues to be an issue all over the nation and in our backyard, in, in Tulare County, and for many students at COS. And on that note, I also want to, before uh, uh, moving on to the next part of this program, I want to state that we have a dream center at the College of the Sequoias. We have a dream center that services our undocumented student population. So we're gonna have that link dropped into the chat as well so that you can circulate that information for students who need those kinds of resources, that kind of support. They can get that support at COS through the Dream Center. And get this, and tomorrow at 11 in the morning, there's gonna be a special workshop. The UFW Foundation is supporting the Dream Center at COS. It's gonna be DACA, am I eligible? So right now there's been legislation that has passed that has really, opened up for more applicants to apply for DACA. And so this is a question, a burning question for many who are you know, living without documented status. So that's gonna be a workshop that's gonna be offered tomorrow at 11. And for those who are unable to make that workshop uh, tomorrow at 11, a UFW immigration attorney will be able to take free consultations to uh, COS undocumented students on March 25th. So you can have one-on-ones. So just want to plug in those resources that are really important. And so making sure that also uh, we're taking care of those who need that kind of support. Panelists, let's continue this platica. And next, I want to draw your attention. Uh, we're going to have an opportunity for you to actually interact now, share your thoughts, uh, share your experiences at any part of the Favela project. But first, we here we have, you know, um, the man who we're honoring with this proyecto, Ricardo Favela, who was uh, born and raised in Tulare County, in Dainuba, who passed away in 2007. So it's in his honor that we're, you know, we're honoring the memory and the legacy of Ricardo Favela, who also went to COS and transferred in 1965 to Sacramento State, where he eventually became an art professor and a co-founder of the Royal Chicano Air Force. And he actually, uh, ran the Barrio Arts Program for over three decades. 
and at Sacramento uh, State. So this is, you know, Ricardo Favela, also known cariñosamente como El Monje Mo. And we have two wonderful images right here. You see Ricardo Favela in, um, you know, in his, in his art studio working. And these both of these pieces are part of the gallery as well. So you can go and check these out. But here, next, what I would like to do is uh, we're actually going to be able to hear and see Ricardo Favela himself. And so he's going to enter now into our plática. So we have this moment to take this in consideration. So without further ado. <laughs> Ricardo Favela, and uh, I was born in Kingsburg, which is down in the San Joaquin Valley. And I spent most of my uh, early youth with my parents going uh, from labor camp to labor camp uh, until we finally, my mother finally decided we were going to settle down, and we settled down in a little town called, called Dainuba because we were there in time for the great picky. So I was very much involved with the art. Ever since I was chavalito, I've always dealt with art so I, I had a knack for it and so I continued in that vein and uh, I went to school here at uh, California State University and I completed my BA in 71 and then in I left school even though I, I entered the master's program but I left early because uh, we started the Centro de Artistas Chicanos uh, it was there in 1969 that I ran into Esteban and Jose Esteban Villa and Jose Montoya I was probably their first student that they had, and uh, well, once uh, I hooked up with them, that was it, man. It was a runaway train because it was, seemed like that's what all that was all that I was waiting for was for somebody to come uh, to pick up uh, to pick up the momentum that I had lost. While I was in school, it was real difficult because I was dealing with uh, with uh, uh, art forms that were very foreign to me. And so I was always trying to do the, the Western European art forms and I got versed in it and I took art history courses and things, but there was always something lacking. And I couldn't put my finger on it until I ran into Esteban and Jose. And it was just very simple. It was just my Chicano heart wanting to do Chicano art. And uh, so that keeps in, in continuance the philosophies that we have as trying to get to as many you know, of our people as we can. So that's why the mural art, the classes, and uh, the poster art have been a very, very important and integral part in the beginning. Now we've expanded it into theater, to drama, into we now have artists and residents. Oh, sure. There's programs here from the California Arts Councils. And um, that philosophy of getting the art to the people is, uh, has been the one that I think has really made what the Centro is really about. It's a nonprofit organization. We were uh, we received our status of nonprofit uh, status in 1972, and uh, we've been the Centro de Artistas since then. That houses the Royal Chicano Air Force, which is the organization that we started out with as an artist. It started out as the Rebel Chicano Artist Front, but uh, we got so much flack behind, you know. You know what? What's this? The Royal Canadian Air Force that we got? We felt slighted, and we said, "Well, the Chicanos can have an Air Force too." <laughs> All right, panelists. Uh, let's. Uh, it's here. We have uh, the words uh, Ricardo Favela himself. Uh, you know, just telling you the significance of what it was for him to engage in the arts and what what the importance it was uh, for him to meet you know, uh, Jose Montoya, Esteban Villa, uh, the meaning of arte and how it spoke to his uh, Chicano heart. So here we have uh, an opportunity panelist uh, for you to let's, uh, let's engage, let's, let's, let's have this platica, let's give some attention. I'm just wanna hand over the floor just to hear these bright minds engage um, the meanings and what your thoughts were from watching and seeing Ricardo Favela, many of you We've been participants uh, as attendees in previous platicas. Uh, I've gone to the exhibit in person, watched it um, virtually. So uh, let's talk about this interview and um, a ver qué les pareció. I think uh, I want to hand it off first to, to Neftali. Uh, por favor, Neftali, share uh, your pensamientos. So upon hearing the interview, um, I thought what he had to say was very raw and very from the heart. And you can tell that um, his art is a way of expression 
not only for himself, but to express also the cultural and everything that he has experienced in his life, as well as the beauty of our culture as well. Um, I did get the chance to go see the art in person and um, upon seeing the posters as well as other little um, sculptures that he made, it really resonated with me in my childhood. One of them was an ice cream truck and had all the um, popsicles on the wall. And it reminds me of my youth running up to the ice cream truck and trying to catch them before they leave and buying the uh, little 3D popsicles, whether it's like a SpongeBob character or a Spider-Man character, all those little things. And I think he did a really great job capturing a lot of key moments of our culture, not only the fun aspects, but also our struggles as well. And that's what I noticed. Um, and that it really is from the heart with his work. Yeah, what I see um, with Favela's art is like, um, you know, it's not necessarily um, forms of, a form of art that I've that I've recognized elsewhere. He seems to be a man that was so firm in his um, self identity that he, he knew what he wanted to create. He knew what he wanted to put out there. Um, and for me to see somebody like that, it's, um, I'm, I'm inspired by that. I'm in awe of that because as somebody who has personally struggled with identity, um, you know, I am, um, I'm, I'm both uh, I'm half Mexican and I'm white. So um, I've struggled with my sense of identity and where I fit in, um, you know, and how I identify. And even though internally I've always um, known how I identify, that's not necessarily how I've been seen on the outside. So um, also when I heard Mr. Favela speak, he talks about how he, um, while he was going to school, he um, tried to learn Western European art forms, right? And that um, he struggled with that because um, that's not like what he, um, what he wanted to do in his heart, that's not who he was. And so I got the connection of, um, you know, this Western European um, uh, uh, history narrative that's being taught in our schools. Um, so, you know, plugging that back into ethnic studies and the fight for ethnic studies, um, I think is important that he said how he used to, how he tried and learned other art forms. Um, and yet that's not really what was calling out to him. Going off of Christina's point, as far as this idea of identity, and he made the statement in his Chicano heart, he knew he wanted to do Chicano art. And I think idea of identity. It's not just this binary, I'm Chicano, I'm not Chicano. It's a very broad spectrum. And identity is one of the first units we cover in ethnic studies, because it varies not only to self-identify, but understanding identities of communities. And specifically in this Chicano Latino community, however the identity goes, it's the sense of imposter syndrome, especially in higher education, do we belong here? Is this space meant for us? And like he mentioned, he started questioning his art form because he knew I'm studying this piece of art, very Western centric, yet it's not acceptable by this art community. And that does come along with questioning, do I really belong in college? Is college really for me? Is this a space, the world of academics? And not only that imposter syndrome, but also overall existing in spaces that were not necessarily carved out for certain people, or you think it's not carved out for you, but you better get a chair and sit at that table. And just I looking and reflecting on idea of identity and it can go so many various ways. So good job, Christina, loved it. So open panelist, anyone else wants to jump in? Entrale. I was in the add-on going off this what Christina and Ambar said, even what was in the video, how we could, that there was something um, different and that he felt almost like foreign to it. Um, just understanding and hearing that he was able to like interpret that and seeing, you know, I was able to go to his, to the art show myself and um, just seeing how he was able to express like the importance of like our cultural values and like even looking at the different pieces of his art, he used different um, like important symbols, like whether it be like 
uh, face of an Aztec or Cesar Chavez or like Adrian or whoever, you know, or even like his incorporation of skeletons. I think um, he was really wanting us to be and cherish, you know, who we are and where we come from. I found just me going to go visit um, very just gave me a sense of pride and just like a sense of comfort. It's knowing how I was able to connect with a lot of the art that he put out. Yeah, and kind of going off of that, um, I totally agree with Christina on the fact that uh, Richard Favela's art form is very, he very much knew what he wanted, or at least he was intentional about everything he created. Um, and I think it also like just looking at his art there, there's a clear influence of like activism. And like, I think like some of the first images that pop up when you Google him um, has to do with like United Farm Workers um, and just that like power in his art. And I had the chance to attend one of the first, if not the first Platica, um, which was Mexican independ independence and BLM or Black Lives Matter. Um, and that was an amazing, amazing platica on the, that connection that between like black and brown uh, solidarity. And I something that spoke to me um, was they had Central Valley Advocacy come over. Um, uh, they're the ones who really, really had the BLM protests take off in Visalia. And it really pointed out how things that relate that are very close to activism, such as like community murals or protest signs are very important forms of art. And both of those things very much remind me of the type of art that Favela really does create and just the power that's in that. Um, and also that idea that it's okay to be unconventional and create your own um, things, especially if they, they speak to people and they have a lot of power. And it's, it's open panelists. So um, if you want to add to another experience that you've had at a, at a Platica, uh, seeing the virtual tour, going into the gallery, uh, but definitely uh, Jacqueline, in terms of that connection that you're making in terms of making art with the message and in purpose, the, how it incites that, that kind of involvement and wonderful connection that you make in terms of the UFW and the role of art and so in the platicas that we've had before this one, we've also had um, the story of how the Royal Chicano Air Force would be out literally in the fields with like a, a makeshift print machine out of vehicles and would print out, you know, posters that would be utilized for the picket line, you know, on the spot. And so, and, you know, having that kind of utility with art and the connections that you're making right now with the BLM too, those are solid connections in terms of the role of art and how it really just brought in. I mean, we talk about L L LD, right? LD, I mean, there's all that that took place in here just not so long ago, right? In terms of the role of art at LD and how it really raised awareness and you know really opened up platicas you know, in the community that had never really taken place like that in a more recent time, right? So you have all these kind of connections that you made in a very, you know, brilliant way to, to, to understand the role that art can play in transmitting, you know, messages and engaging and pushing people's consciousness, pushing people to think and reconsider. Wonderful. Any other panelists, por favor. I think, you know, for him too, he was lucky enough to realize that art was an outlet for him, um, you know, and I, I feel like, you know, some youth are not um, like lucky enough, um, if that's the right word, to to find healthy outlets, right? And, and instead, they kind of like might stray away from school or might gravitate towards other sort of unhealthy, you know, lifestyle choices. And so I think that um, Mr. Favela is um, a great, uh, you know, uh, role model for, for uh, the youth because, you know, he was able to um, channel this outlet and, and um, find a healthy way to, uh, you know, express himself and to portray himself. And not only that, but, you know, portray his people um, and the struggles that they went through and the st uh, struggles that they, you know, were currently facing and everything. So 
um, you know, for me that that was something too that I noticed about him. Yes. Thanks for sharing that, Christina. And, and also a reference to that this is um, a video that is a lengthier version is part of the exhibit. So you can find the lengthier version of this video production on um, the Arts Visalia page where there's an interview with Favela. And this is a lengthier version is on that web page and actually has so many people who've been influenced by favela speak there after him so it ties in exactly what you're saying just wanted to put that out there and xavier i see uh, you have your hand up please jump in oh no i was gonna say when attending um i think for me with i went with a couple of my friends uh, last thursday and for them and for all of us it was really kind of the first time we had been to any type of like art exhibit and even just being there alone like just by ourselves and um, with Favela, he used a lot of, of vibrant colors. And, you know, as mentioned earlier with, with his message of portraying, you know, farm workers or um, whether it be, you know, community, community like uh, togetherness or just different events going on, um, they all just kind of revolved around bringing the community together and just celebrating our, our culture. And yeah, it was very meaningful and almost insp inspirational itself. Thank you for sharing, for sure, definitely. Um, would any other panelists like to jump in? One more panelist, uh, one more commentario before we make a transition uh, to the uh, the next uh, the next part of our our program. Um, I'd like to um, point out uh, one of his uh, uh, favelas, uh, the sculptures that he did on um, the veteranos. I felt like how they were, how the other panelists were saying how he expressed that, like he found a way to channel his, you know, his feelings, his, you know, express to his emotions. And I felt in some way um, in, on this quote, he has on the flyer, Sus Amigos Son Buena Medicina. And, you know, I felt like in that, in that piece he was kind of promoting like to talk with your friends like express yourself especially during different times of struggles and I just I don't know I just felt like it was um it was a message that needed to be heard from you know especially the older you know older generation that you know you talk to your friends express yourself and I was um, glad that he found art was a way to express and share and promoted that through other um, other individuals to do the same through his art and through art in general. Yeah, thanks for mentioning that. Definitely, that's powerful. Um, that was part of the, the previous platica, in fact, right? We had that or that medicina, artes medicina, you know, it's also from that expression yeah. como la cultura cura, right? And I think our panelists uh, also made a reference, uh, Josie Talamantes that flipped it too, how la, la locura cura. <laughs> I like that <laughs> expression, how that was expressed too. Uh, Marilyn, did you want to say something about Las Girls? Las Girls um, del Valle? Um, yeah, it's going to come back to like what the we we're talking about, like how art, like the way that they were, ex he was expressing his art to the community. It's also like that with the talk that I seen, it, it was very inspiring to me as well because of the artist showing her art to symbolize the power of a woman, which I thought was so beautiful because I would see her pieces of art, Esther Hernandez's art. And I never really understood what her art meant until when I was in the talk, they were talking about her art and showing examples. And I thought it was crazy because I was like, wait, like I would see her art pieces. I never understood her art pieces. I never really got to see the point that she wanted to make with her art until like the talk they were explaining that she wanted to symbolize the power of women, which I thought it was, it was so beautiful and like really crazy how art really does show so much and it really expresses the person's like the what they want to tell everyone and I thought that was really really beautiful 
And it also connected to my own experience of one of the art pieces that she made of the Virgen de Guadalupe. It really compared to me as when uh, my mom and my grandma would give me the Virgen de Guadalupe as an example of the power of women to see her as powerful, like for me to remember that she is a very, very part, a uh, part of a powerful woman. And I just think that that's, it kind of went to this of seeing the video, like how he wanted to inspire the community with it. And I just thought it really connected to what I had seen before. It's very inspiring and very beautiful. Awesome, gracias for sharing and plugging that in because it is it is significant, uh, all these different pieces and that have been part of this Platica series. And um, just a, a panelist, uh, tremendas pláticas que tenemos ahorita, tremendous plática that we're engaging in right now. And we're gonna make a, a brief shift to the last portion of our, of our plática, but I just wanted to uh, give uh, thanks uh, uh, to Clara, uh, widow of Ricardo Favela, who actually really encouraged us to integrate this part into the program, to be able to have an opportunity to hear the voice of Ricardo Favela. And we found this video, and then also we see, not hear not only his voice, but see him actually speaking in this video image. But the, the also wanna um, remind us of, of the video audio recording that we actually heard also narrates a similar message that we saw with this video too. And I think is really significant because in that audio recording, if you recall, Ricardo also talks about his experience when he was at Sacramento at State, when he was actually told by a professor who didn't get his style, didn't get you know what he was conveying and was so discouraging and telling them, didn't think this art thing is for you, you know, something along those lines. And right now we're just, so like impacted and seeing the importance of how meaningful his art is for us right now to be able to talk about. You could just think about that. Think about that experience and how many experiences have been replicated like that over time since that moment that he gave that testimony in the late 70s into today, 2021, who didn't really get, you know, where Favela was coming from with this arte and was discouraging to the point that would have made a big difference in his life if he wasn't that Chicano that, you know, that he wasn't to be like down to continue his path to have, you know, this wonderful legacy that we're able to experience today. So gracias, Clara, for encouraging us, for, for putting this into the programa. And so, um, so panelists, we're gonna now transition, uh, everyone, we're gonna transition to the, to the last part of our, of our plática. And with this part of the plática, what I would like to do, I wanna just, give a little bit of a background on ethnic studies. So this is what we're getting to. And all of this was there, you know, moving towards this part of the platica on, on ethnic studies. And, and what is it is the question because many people are saying ethnic studies. Many people are wanting to get part of the ethnic studies pie, um, but it's important to really get into the grounding of, of what it is. Ethnic studies is interdisciplinary. Ethnic studies is not just a history class. It's not a sociology class. It's interdisciplinary. It draws from all these different kinds of disciplines and it makes it, what's, what's really important is it's a comparative study that looks at race, looks at ethnicity. It brings in the experiences, the voices of peoples of color, of four historically defined groups, American Indian, um, African American, the Chicano and Asian American, uh, uh, studies. So these are the four defined groups what that is ethnic studies. And it's really moved and motivated by the purpose of looking at the impact of systemic and structural racism to have conversations about anti-racism, decolonization, decolonizing our minds, right? Of, of decentering whiteness, of loving your black and brown skin, yellow skin, red skin, you know, embracing that as a source of pride. So these are kinds of the, the things that are very central to what is ethnic studies. And historically, as uh, Christina mentioned, it was motivated and moved in San Francisco in 1968 by the longest student held strike at a university campus. All right, that's what it took to get ethnic studies at a university campus. And that was the Third World Liberation Front. It was the name of that movement, the Third World Liberation Strike. That took place in 1968 
and they were victorious in 1969. But what it took is that ethnic interracial solidarity. That's a lesson from history that tells us in order for us to be successful, we need to make sure that we come together. There's la unión nace la fuerza. You know, that is a message that we get from the UFW. Third World Liberation Front has also exemplified that when all the groups got together to move forward to demand ethnic studies. It wasn't because an administrator thought it was the right thing to do. It came from the students who mobilized forward to get this at San Francisco State in 1969. That is one origin story of ethnic studies and how it became incorporated into higher education. But we also have the East LA blowouts that took place also. And these were high school students, high school students like many of you who actually walked out East LA high schools and took it to the streets were concerned parents, que va pasar con mi muchachita, mi muchachito, you know, who were getting tossed up by law enforcement in Los Angeles and also criminalized for demanding what? Education, et ethnic studies, you know, uh, teachers that look like them, you know, que mal, que, que, que de mal tiene eso? You know, you know how, not nothing at all. So that's also part of the origin story of what really took to get ethnic studies at in, in, in education. And those are like in public schools and universities, public universities. But there's also the stories of universities like DQ University. DQ University were actually, these are autonomous schools that took place outside of public education. And also another one is La Universidad de la Raza in Fresno, in Colegio de la Tierra in Tulare County. These are actually school sites that exist. And it's important to acknowledge that history because ethnic studies is taking place right now, but there's also a very deep history that came before a 2021 that has led for ethnic studies to actually be more than 50 years old, more than a half a century old. So right now we're partaking in a conversation about ethnic studies that has been around the sun more than once. Okay, so we, um, so it's important to also acknowledge the status COS actually has an ethnic studies program since the 90s, offering different classes in Black American studies, American Indian studies, social justice studies, Chicano studies, Chicana studies, Asian American studies are offered at COS. And it was, uh, you know, and it was because of it didn't have a full time tenured faculty until 2019. And I feel very fortunate to actually have that charge to lead the ethnic studies department forward. But I am only one of 17 ethnic studies full time professors in the whole state of California in the California Community College system. Let that just sit on your mind for a minute. 17 for 115 campuses of community colleges in the state of California. So if we want to get into a discussion of institutionalized racism, if we want to get into a discussion of ethnic studies as equity, equity is addressing the barriers and tearing those barriers down. That is equity. And right now, there's a huge barrier in terms of the amount of full-time ethnic studies professors at the state of California. But you know, there's also a movement in K through 12. There's a very strong movement to get ethnic studies K through 12. And we had you know, we have three of the largest school districts in California that has ethnic studies as a requirement, K through 12. Um, Fresno Unified School District being one of them, our neighbor just next door to us actually has a, a graduation requirement for Fresno Unified School District. This image that you see in the background, that is actually from Coachella uh, Unified School District in Southern California. They have honor classes in ethnic studies there. They're not elective, they have honor classes. They have, <laughs> they have a class in social justice statistics. Okay, check that, check this out. These are some of the awesome things that are happening. Why? Because there's tremendous benefits. There's tremendous benefits where studies have shown that students are more likely to go to class. Students are not only likely, more likely to go to class, but also to graduate, have higher GPAs, go off to college and to graduate. These are the benefits. So if we're talking about equity, removing the challenges and barriers before the students of color, ethnic studies is providing that. So now we also have it in context here for us to actually, to be able to hear your voices, hear your voices about your experiences with ethnic studies. And so without further ado, I would like to draw our attention to our panelists who have something to say about the significance of ethnic studies to them. 
And also in light of all the conversation that's circulating right now in Tulare County with eyes on Visalia Unified School District, panelists, uh, please share your experiences with us. Neftali. So as a student currently in the Ethnic Studies course at Riverwood High School, which is the first course um, to be offered in all of USD, I have definitely um, been introduced to so many wonderful cultures and history of other ethnicities in America, not just my own culture as a Latina, but other cultures that contribute to American society and our neighbors and our friends and other people that we make day-to-day -day contact with. And um, throughout this year, I've been surprised at how much positivity and how much I have learned that I've never learned before in my K-12 education. And um, being a high school senior, I was kind of disappointed that this is the first time that I'm learning about all this positive contributions. And for me taking this course, I realized that more students should be able and should be offered to take this course in the first place. Um, given the recent controversy in the community, I was really disappointed in the miscommunication and the misinterpretation of what this course really does for students. And I wanna make it known that this course doesn't teach um, victimhood and it doesn't teach um, students about the negative um, American society, it speaks to the truth of what people have had to go through in America. And I think that is really important for students to understand so that we can better um, communicate with others and have empathy for others. And I noticed that with all of my classmates, everyone this year has been astounded that um, we have all learned so many positive things as I keep mentioning, but really that other people keep mentioning how we're not old enough to be having these conversations. And I think my classmates really take that to heart because they wish that um, the community would understand that we do want to have these conversations and we do want to learn all these um, other cultures in our society and all these other ethnicities in our society because the only way that we will really be able to understand each other as Americans is to understand our struggles and to understand what we have gone through. said, I think that our youth absolutely deserve this type of curriculum. And like she mentioned, where these students are not, oh, well, they're too mature and let's pass up the opportunity to teach them. They absolutely can handle this content. This content isn't this mind-blowing graduate level content. It's very interdisciplinary and it goes beyond just content. There's reading skills, there's writing skills that are being developed. I had a student say, hey, I actually know how to write a sentence in a paragraph now. I'm like, cool, you learned that in an ethnic studies class. And it is beyond just the academics because we look at the idea of campus representation and community representation. A lot of these students end up having a sense of pride, end up having this confidence. They end up using this, not just in class, but on campus, but also the community themselves. They're standing up for themselves. They're understanding these institutions that exist and these concepts that they're like, not sure that's what the word is, but now I understand that the word I'm looking for is pride and grateful for understanding. So it moves beyond the classroom and into the communities. And that's why it is so important to have ethnic studies in the classrooms. It's not like mentioned, this victimhood where we're gonna sit around and point fingers. It's this idea to get this historical narrative, analyze it, look at these social factors that exist, look at these other factors that exist because it is very interdisciplinary. And overall, it helps to build these healthy ways to express themselves. Like mentioned in our last portion, like Christina said, where art was a way of expression and ethnic studies is a way for our students to express themselves as well. Right now, pandemic's happening. Social emotional learning is super important and ethnic studies helps facilitate that because it creates a space on campus for students to feel like they belong. A lot of them feel, oh, well, I can't connect to being those students part of ASB or part of the popular crowd, or I don't have the opportunity to be on campus because I have to go home and work the fields or start doing whatever at the house. So it brings these students who are normally marginalized within their campus to have a safe space. And like I said, it goes beyond learning ethnic studies as a curriculum in the classroom because you see 
the effects afterwards on campus and in the community. So I can't stress enough how this is absolutely building a case for equity, not just academically, but in our community and overall our society. Come on, Pana, let's jump in there. Um, I'm gonna say something. Uh, the way that they were talking about ethnic studies, I feel like I, I'm disappointed in my old high school that I, I attended that they didn't have this class, which I feel like if they would have had it when I was a senior, I feel like I would have seen the community in a way, in a way different, um, in a different way. Cause uh, now I'm barely learning about this, like uh, about ethnic studies. I never really understood what it, it was never really understood what I would learn from it. And like now hearing them talk, like I tell myself, like I'm disappointed that my old high school didn't have this class because um, it would have really helped a lot of young people speak up and really change something and also change the way that they feel about themselves. Because I feel like that's for me, I feel like that would have helped me uh, as a young person and build my confidence and help people out and speak to others about what is right. Yeah, I want to add on to um, what Marlene said. And like, I think the common misconception with ethnic studies is that by teaching it, you're going to worsen race relations. Like, I see so many articles on that, that, oh, you're going to teach people about like, all these different events. And like, you're just going to like, create like, animosity or hatred or so on and so on. And I, I disagree because I think in teaching ethnic studies, you really teach people of color, like the empowering acts that like everyone like them participated in. It's like, it's ethnic studies is a medium for empowerment. It's resilience and it's something that they can look on and identify themselves like, oh, this person like did this, this person worked in the fields or packaged fruit or worked in a hotel, like so on and so forth. I do that and yet look at wh what they did. Um, and it's also like why there's such, why people of color are underrepresented in academia. Like you have all these systemic barriers, but you also have them like being discouraged from like a really young age and passive means. It's like, oh, well, like you don't learn about people that do this. So, you know, it's like, they're not really encouraged to do so. And it, that's why it's so important to have Chicano professors and instructors because you have that solidarity of like, they did this and so can you. And it's really what young people need today because they face so much, like um, they face so many systemic um, forms of racism. And that just leads them to believe that like, oh, well, you know, something is like, this is a sign for me to not pursue this, or this is a sign for me to not do this but that's exactly why they should do it. It's about overcoming like the adversities that they face and just um, like going back to the that idea of identity, like being proud of like one's ethnicity, one's culture, et cetera, et cetera, because rather than overcoming it, they should embrace it and go on to be who they want to be in terms of professions. Um, yeah, just echoing everything that my fellow panelists have said already. Um, you know, uh, you wanna talk about like personal experience. Um, just like Marlene, I, well, I come from a generation where ethnic studies um, was not offered to me in grade school. It was not offered to me in middle school. It was not offered to me in high school. Um, and so here I am today, um, you know, I took a break, you know, from uh, completing college and here I am back in college and, um, you know, I'm in an ethnic studies class and ethnic studies classes really have the power to transform because I know because I'm living that transformation myself. Um, before I took this class, um, I, I described myself to my professor as like, I was like this ball, like curled up, right? And um, as I'm taking this class, I really feel like I'm coming out of that ball and I'm like coming into myself. And so um, what ethnic studies classes are, they are safe places, just like everybody has said. Um, they're places where students who face a lot of emotional distress, um, you know, can come 
um, to talk about um, things and to talk about um, histories and to talk about oppression. Um, but more importantly, you know, aside from all of the, you know, systemic racism that ethnic studies classes do talk about, what I have come to realize about ethnic studies is that it is a class about um, liberation. It's a class about um, um, learning, you know, the resiliency of these people who have come from decades and decades of oppression. So yes, you learn about that, but you're also learning about, you know, the victories that they um, have uh, found in their in in overcoming this oppression. Um, so you know, this is a movement for um, Latinx um, people, for Black American people, for Asian American people, um, and other cultures, um, for students to reclaim their voice, um, to find their voice in the first place, um, and to know the truth, uh, to know the truth about history. Um, and yes, it's a painful history, but you know, knowing that history allows them a chance to heal um, and a chance to do something about it. Um, and so ethnic studies classes, they, they teach acceptance. Um, and uh, yeah, I, there, there are just limitless uh, positive impacts to students, um, to the motivation of students. Um, and, you know, even for students who maybe cannot directly um, relate to what is being taught, maybe they are not people of color, um, ethnic studies classes teach them a way to relate. Um, so there's also uniquely beneficial experiences for all those people who are not necessarily seeing themselves in the curriculum of ethnic studies, but more importantly, there is that representation for people um, to see themselves in the curriculum. Um, and I think Ambar said it in the chat, and I was thinking it um, as she typed it, representation matters. Um, and so for um, young students to be able to see themselves in the curriculum, um, it, it does wonders, wonders for their confidence. Um, and yeah, thank you. Going off of that, I mean, this discussion is so rich, but going off of what Christina said and this idea that um, we should, I mean, everyone has kind of touched on this, but we should be able to see ourselves. I think that is such an important thing, going back to this idea of it being a case for equity. I definitely think that's what it is. And this information needs to be more accessible to people. Having gotten to take in social justice studies was so amazing in getting to understand this, what liberation really is and how people have carried it out in the past has been so amazing. Um, and also something that was really special about social justice studies was um, not only seeing you know, how people have been treated and how different people of color um, have been treated in America, but how they've reacted to it and not just overcome it, but embraced it and um, embraced who they are to try to change the systems around them and liberate themselves. So it's been a really amazing experience. And I hope to continue um, with my ethnic studies journey, despite whatever I'll be studying in the future. Awesome. If in, please, Christina, you want to jump in there, please. I was just going to talk about a little bit about, you know, the, what um, the community is facing now, um, you know, as far and maybe, maybe, uh, you know, the people who go to Redwood can kind of talk about this even more too about um, the concerned citizens that are, you know, having an issue with the textbook. Um, and um, I just, it's hard for me to kind of understand where they're coming from. Um, and so I just, I'm so proud of uh, the students, you know, for, for not being afraid to, to speak their truth, to, to, to speak out and say what they want, um, what is right for them. And um, I'm just, I'm just proud, proud of them for doing that. All right, thank you so much, definitely. I, and it really kinds of sets, uh, uh, this is, uh, ethnic studies is about centering the voices, right? Centering the voices of African-Americans, American Indians, Asian-Americans, the Chicanx community. So like here right now, 
within your voices presented forth, you know, it, it's centering that experience from a whole different perspective that, you know, that really is so far away from those voices that you just mentioned, Christina. So this is coming in and showing how, it, like this discussion is rich, as you mentioned, Jacqueline, this is a very rich discussion and we're getting into this platica and going in really deep about the importance of the platica that we're having and what it does, these kinds of benefits of what we see and, and how it really centers those experiences, how it brings them in. So that reference that I made earlier about historically marginalized, his, you know, historically minority, not minority, minoritized, right? Huge difference, significant difference. And, and definitely, Ambar, representation matters. So the fact that you are all here this evening vocalizing you know, your beautiful thoughts and putting them forth, that's representing the truth of those experiences of how these courses are impacting you. And so historically, those contributions have not been recognized of the farm workers, right? We're not talking so much about those experiences because they've been marginalized. And not that those contributions are marginal, because what would this country be without the harvest of farm workers? Those are significant contributions, but those contributions have been marginalized. The fact that we are not a minority, peoples of color are the majority in the state of California, but we've been have minoritized. So this is what's so critical about representation to get up and speak, and that's ethnic studies, you know, getting involved getting involved in making sure that these experiences are being told. The origin story, one of them, of the Third World Liberation Front was because students got together and they organized. They organized and they came together. And so I just wanna just acknowledge how beautiful this has come together, the weaving of all your voices to bring in some consciousness raising for the public to understand where the youth, where a teacher is coming from you know, from this perspective and vocalizing your concerns and interests for ethnic studies. I'm not sure if anyone, uh, if we have time for maybe one or two more comments, or anybody else like to add? Because otherwise this might bring us to wrapping it up. Okay, so real quick, this is kind of, I mean, it, it relates because of intersectionality, but it's not ethnic studies in particular. But I think it also like reaches the importance of BIPOC authors in the English curriculum. Like you hear about um, racism through To Kill a Mockingbird, but um, there's so many other books that give BIPOC authors the platform to tell their own story. And I really think that those should also be incorporated into the curriculum. One more panelists. Would anyone else like to add to the platica before we wrap this up? Y'all have been awesome. Yeah, I like to go off of Alejandra's point as far as the representation in our curriculum and literature. And I think that goes along with stressing the importance of getting a seat at that table because a lot of the people who are creating this curriculum at the state level, at the federal level, are then handing it to teachers when there is no representation to begin with when it was being made. So it's very important for the youth to speak up and to hold a place at that table. If they pull the chair, then you stand up, but you need to be there and we need to be there. And it's super awesome to have supportive people you've seen in the community who shows up for you, who doesn't. And I'm super excited to see the youth, the future. And so I feel like I could take a break and relax knowing that you exist. So thank you. Amen. I second that to the fullest. And this has just been a wonderful evening. I don't want to bring this to an end. I want this to continue. I feel like we're barely getting this thing warmed up. <laughs> you know, Christina, would you like to say something? I just want to say, yeah, one more thing. You know, I, I come, I came from like be, being taught like not to really, not necessarily not stand up for myself, but like not to be like non-confrontational you know that that's kind of like how I was taught growing up and I think even like that's how my grandparents taught my my mom and and all of her siblings is like to kind of like be a non-confrontational person and so for many years of my life I kind of 
like sat back, you know, and allowed other people to make decisions around me um, and, and not necessarily like stand up for myself. So, so for, for like the personal experience that ethnic studies, what it has done for me is that has given me like this great amount of confidence um, in recognizing and in standing up for myself and what, what is like right and what is wrong, you know? And so um, I just would encourage anybody out there um, who, you know, has the opportunity to take an ethnic studies class, you know, see for yourself what it is about, you know, so that then you can challenge people who might, you know, have these misconceptions because there are very many misconceptions. I had many too before I took the class, not, not necessarily, you know, bad misconceptions, just, you know, um, not knowing. And so, I would, yeah, I would just encourage, you know, anybody who has an opportunity to take an ethnic studies class to take it and to see for yourself what it's about. And, you know, maybe you will be transformed by it and maybe you won't, but I guarantee you, you will probably learn a lot, um, which you will then, you know, take with you. So that's all I was going to say. <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, thank you for saying that. And I really hope that uh, members of Visalia Unified School District hear your voices, take your voices that you made this evening into account in their planning for the future. And other districts within the, the, the Tulare County do the same. So this is so important that, you know, this actually expands. Ethnic studies saves lives. Literally, it saves lives. I have so many students who decided to continue with their education rather than hitting it in the streets, rather than dropping out and doing something else. This literally saves lives. Students have told me this, and it's been my personal case as well. You know, it saves lives, you know, and it's also going to give more life to our community. So this is something that needs to change, that the stories of BIPOC, and thank you for throwing that terminology in there, Alejandra, kudos on that. Um, they need to be centered indeed. So I just uh, let this be the change that we want to see for the future. And panelists, tremendous job, you know, getting all kinds of love on that chat as, as you should. And so, and definitely participants show our panelists some love and this brings our, 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 um, our evening to a conclusion, but I wanted to remind everyone that we have other events taking place. Uh, again, as we started, we have virtual chats that take place that are conversations about the uh, art exhibit, Ricardo Favela art exhibit. 14th at 2 p.m. It will be the next one. You get to converse with one of the committee members, be it Dr. Vasquez or another committee member who's been organizing uh, these, uh, the Ricardo Favela project. On the 21st at 2 p.m., you actually will have live uh, members of the Royal Chicano Air Force, and that will be hosted by Fast Eddie Salas on the 21st. And on the 21st at 4 to 6 will be the mural project, Reimagining Justice. And our very last platica for this it will be on the 25th of March. And that will be Seeing and Unseen the Art and Legacy of Ricardo Favela with special guest uh, Josie Talamantes uh, and Ricardo uh, Montoya and Richard Montoya. Richard Montoya, and this will take place on the 25th and will also include uh, Tina Favela as well, hosted by Eddie Salas. And so this would not be possible. Uh, without the support of our sponsors. Just really want to give a shout out to our sponsors and also wanted to give a shout out to all the attendees, all 41 of you that are with us this evening, you know, and we're, you know, after the time and panelists, again, uh, you give me hope for the future, you know, hope for the future. This is a need of, of, of connecting, a feeling of, uh, a feeling of connection has been made for me this evening. And I hope you would agree participants uh, how bright the future looks and how it sounded this evening. And so also the prior panelists, DJ Ome, Dr. Ella Diaz, uh, Josie Talamantes, Barbara Carrasco, shout outs to you, uh, Milena Saeed for doing that LibGuide, COS, Lauren Fishback, who has been helping us and giving us support so that we actually have the Zoom platform to utilize at uh, COS, Ampelio Mejia from Arts Consortium, Juan Arzola, Professor of Political Science and committee member, Narciso Var uh, Vargas, Hector Uriarte, also committee member from Pachango, uh, Barbara uh, Leard, also ESL instructor from COS, 
uh, Dr. Maria Asokar, uh, Professor of Sociology Committee member, Justin Stein, who's doing a lot of the, the technical stuff on handling the social media platforms, James Espinoza, the one and only, the Zoom master in the background on the ones and twos, and a professor of English at COS, uh, Amy Rangel, an extraordinaire, you know, handling all the designs on the on on our on our on our marketing ma materials with the close connection to Arts Visalia, Professor of Art at COS, Roberto de la Rosa uh, from Hola Raza, and also invested so much time and energy uh, and and with uh, with the art uh, Ricardo Favela in the exhibit presentation, um, Dr. Lucia Vasquez. Uh, who's been giving us, keeping us organized, uh, who, who, who worked the wonders of the pen to make sure that we actually had the money to get this project funded. And we made a dollar, uh, we made a dollar stretch from 15 cents with the creativity and participation of so many in this project. And the one and only uh, Fast Eddie Salas, who vision it was a close friend of the late Ric uh, Ricardo Favela, who had really close ties, uh, has close ties to the Favela family. Um, so who had this vision to bring this exhibit to the Central Valley. And so uh, just a special thank you to all the committee members, special thank you to Clara, to Tina, the, fa the Favela family as a whole. And so just uh, wanna wish everyone a good evening. And so we just really hope you enjoyed this and make sure you continue to support. And thank you for, for your wonderful support this evening. Everyone have a blessed evening. Buenas noches. Gracias a todos por su apoyo.